Okay, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to Coffee Microcaps. My name is uh, Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps. I'd like to welcome you all to what is now the 12th edition in the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting series. I'm just going to run through a couple of quick housekeeping slides and then we're going to get um, straight to our first presenter. Clients in disclaimer. Um, for anybody who hasn't joined us in one of our previous webinars, um, we run for the hour. We've got two companies uh, with 30 minutes each, broken down with our presenters doing a 20 minute prezzo, and then we leave 10 minutes open for Q&A at the end. If you have any questions, can you please type them in the Q&A box, not in the uh, chat box? Uh, and then I'll moderate the questions and put as many as we, we can to the presenter at the end. Um, if you miss something in the presentation or a slide or want to watch it back or watch one of our previous uh, 11 events, um, the webinar is being recorded and to be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel probably in the next day or so. Uh, if you want to follow us, uh, Twitter is definitely the best place to follow us. As I said, YouTube for all previous recordings and this recording. Uh, LinkedIn, I do additional long form content and I also do a subscription newsletter via the Substack platform. Uh, our first presenter this morning is going to be Mr. Nick Lim from Aid Common, and then he's going to be followed by Mr. Andreas Creel from the MEM. So I'm going to quickly stop sharing my screen now and hand over to Nick and we can get on the way, Nick. Thanks, Mark. We'll get things going. Good morning, everyone. Okay, I can see your uh, cover slide now, Nick. Okay, well, good to go. All right, thanks for having me. I'll just get started. We've got our disclaimer as well. Um, and just let me get started. It common we IPO'd in August 2014. And today we are a enterprise software as a service business, uh, primarily for large uh, organizations, be it public or private. And over the last, I would say, uh, six months or so, we've started to overlay fintech payments and business models onto our business. And we're now very excited to share with the market uh, more information about what we're doing around uh, an update on expense aid our new product, Card Hero, and of course our, our payment business, Pay Hero. So in very in short, we are a software subscription service available on the cloud. We primarily receive our income from recurring subscription revenue and transaction-based revenue. We do a lot with uh, large corporates and with government, uh, primarily in Australia. So the main product that we have is Expense Aid. Uh, Expense Aid is a travel and expense management tool. It is used uh, primarily for employers who have many corporate credit cards and many streams of payments that they have to make by credit cards or that they receive a lot of digital receipts and invoices. So I'll give you an example. If you have a customer who's got a corporate credit card from Westpac it's a Visa, MasterCard, or they've got American Express cards, or they receive their DHL, SG fleet bills uh, digitally. They can then process those expenses through our system. And our system is always connected or communicating with the payroll systems, the financial ERP slash accounting systems of these large organizations. At any one point in time, we are always knowledgeable about who your employee is, what their uh, authorizations are to make approvals for expenses or to prove someone else, approve someone else's trip. We're able to define what cost centers they can allocate their expenses in, etc. So a bit of an update on what's happened with us uh, over the course of Q1. Uh, 20, uh, financial year 2021. We've been able to grow through COVID. COVID did affect us in terms of our recurring revenue and I'll touch upon that a little later on. But primarily 
we were able to continue to engage our clients and continue to grow with new, six new agencies signing on during the quarter to come on to Expensive and to also use our travel modules. In addition to, and the five agencies that came through were from the service delivery office or the Department of Finance Shared Services Hub, where another agency called Apanza also joined us. Apanza is within the Department of Industry Shared Service uh, Agency, um, and they've also uh, been um, implemented to come on board to expense aid as well. A few other highlights that we had were that we signed a three-year agreement with EML Payments to work with them to issue prepaid MasterCards to support the Card Euro platform. I'll touch more on that later as well. And I think what's important as well is that we've actually begun to start to commercialize Card Euro Plus and um, the, uh, the starting uh, implementation activity began last month, which is September. So revenue for Q1 was 940,000. Um, I'll, I'll touch more on recurring and transaction revenue later. And the main thing is that the cash position is strong at about 1.9 million. Um, we've had two quarters of operating cash inflow, which is nice. And we've had a nice uh, bump in implementation revenue, which, is correspond which corresponds with the new uh, implementations that we want through the six new agencies. The business um, since IPO took a little while to grow in terms of the expense aid business, but you can certainly see that from FY17 onwards, we have really started to find our legs and grow the size of transactions managed through our system. So in the last 12, in, in financial 20, uh, we processed 616 million uh, in transactions through the system. We are an established player and it is actually quite a diversified blue chip client base. Um, and if I can just quickly step in uh, to talk through around you know, we're about 140,000 accounts on our platform, about 120,000 users. Um, right now, there are 140 federal and state government agencies split between federal government, New South Wales, and Northern Territory. So in, in NT, we are the whole government provider. In New South Wales, we cover about 90% of the government, uh, except for a few agencies. And uh, I've touched on the value of transactions we've managed over the period of time. And the key drivers around the travel expense management space is, is ultimately, this is a non-core uh, you know, platform for technology. So really, they just want it to be as seamless as possible. They want it to be as predictive as possible. And ultimately, the idea here is to keep employees safe for when they make an expense or travel, etc., on behalf of the organization. They want to make sure that they're doing it within policy um, and they're doing it as efficiently as possible just to help the organization deal with where these expenses should be allocated, what cost center, Etc. who should do the approvals uh, prior to the transaction. We managed to still grow our revenue more, uh, very modestly um, on a you know, PCP basis. Um, and like we, I said earlier, implementation revenue was up strongly. When you look at the FY20 sales revenue split, you can really see that it is diversified blue chip clients. The, we do not view government as one uh, kind of entity or segment. Um, it is a vertical uh, and, and, there, and there are ways to work uh, effectively with government. But I think our state government clients are independent of each other and so it's federal government. And you can see about a one third split uh, quite evenly. We do continue to expect FedGov to grow uh, because that is where the opportunity set with, is with us. And I'll expand on that a little bit later. Now if you look at our revenue profile, there, there is traditionally seasonality in our revenue. And historically, Q4 has always been the strongest quarter, be it from a SaaS revenue basis, which is the, the bottom darkest part uh, of the chart, um, generally to, you know, across the board, implementations are generally the strongest as well. 
and you see a marked difference in Q4 FY20. And then, and that is clearly the effect of COVID uh, on us. We we saw a dip, uh, particularly in, in travel related revenue. About 70% of our revenue is, is kind of recurring subscription based. The other 30% is variable. As some clients will pay us on a per expense transaction basis. And of course, from a, for our travel product, uh, there is a, a platform component, but it's primarily driven by a per transaction component. So travel was affected and continues to be affected. And if, as you've seen in the last two quarters, but we now clearly see, you know, if you would call it like a bottom up, that, that is where it, it will sit. And we've seen some growth uh, thereafter over the last quarter now. So the, the, the things have stabilized. So generally, if, if you would ask us where, where our trend, where we were hitting uh, pre-COVID, you can certainly see would, would have been a, a pretty decently higher number. So here's a stronger illustration. Um, what we've also done is that we've seen corporates increase their ARPU with us in this period. We've seen government, especially FedGov, decrease ARPU uh, because of travel. And the reason is because New South Wales government doesn't use as much as our, our travel component. Uh, it's, it's largely the power industry in New South Wales who uses. Whereas within FedGov, all 20, just under 30 agencies uh, would be using our travel component. So they're a much bigger user of our travel component and, and hence uh, when the travel stopped, it, it affected uh, that side of the revenue. We do see that the the, with the corporates, the corporates increase the number of cards they use on the system. Uh, There's a combination of work from home, but a combination of all kind of business process changes due to COVID-19. So a lot, you know, more cards were issued and more transactions were done because they were used to do things like procurement payments, etc. And so we see that trend continuing as well. Um, and in fact, on a current basis, corporate ARPU is the highest amongst all the, uh, the different segments of our clients. The other thing that we've done is we've ramped up the, um, the, move, the onboarding and the marketing of new features, like an upgrade of OCR, etc. cetera. Uh, because during this period, what we find is that once they've settled down on the COVID with practice and work from home, et cetera, there is now a lot of downtime for, you know, administrators, et cetera, to upgrade and tool up their processes. And this has allowed us to go in there um, and generate more, you know, new features and selling more, more, um, more services to them uh, to enhance their usage. And, and ultimately we will drive an increase in our pool. So we've not uh, kind of fiddled our thumbs during this period. We've really actively gone now, win new customers, do more with our existing customers. So how are we positioned? You know, well, the two things. One is that we're, you know, in 2019, we became a globally recognized leader in the space. Uh, there is no question. Uh, we are the only, um, there, it, it, is, it is tough to get on the IDC list. It, it's nothing to do with sponsorships, et cetera. They come to us and they say, We've heard about you guys, we've done a review, you've been recommended by some of your clients. We want to engage and talk to you about it. And uh, so it's been a very uh, nice bit of uh, third party validation, recognition of the work that we put in uh, to deliver what we believe is a world class leading product. And the growth part really is, is one of the things that we've been able to build up is I would like to call it a soft order book of uh, two shared services mandates from industry finance uh, who give us a pipeline of agencies to onboard and this is a really nice uh, you know base of, of, of potential that we have uh, that we've you know ultimately built in uh, to the business why why uh, you know organizations are engaged to use our product um, I've got the examples there but ultimately they do they are looking for you know uh, operational efficiencies and, and they want to do more governance as well So next is the exciting bit. Um, you know, I want to just share a little bit of history about why Card Hero has come about. So essentially, there are a few components to it. 
Card Hero came about because we spend a lot of time with our clients. And when we spend our time with our clients, the main thing we talk to them about is where are you finding choke points in your operational uh, processes? Where are you finding uh, issues in terms of, um, you know, what are audit, uh, you know, what, what are audits coming up with? And, and, you know, are there any governance issues you have in dealing with things? And we start, we realized that there is, there is an interesting thing that uh, on a, just to go back a little bit, Card Hero has two products and two distinctive use cases. So this Card Hero, which is a integrated prepaid expense management card, and this Card Hero Plus, which is an integrated fund disbursement and spend management solution. So one deals with Card Hero being a payment card and there is an expense management component to make sure we know what's been done in this reporting. Card Hero Plus is about a fund disbursement capability and therefore being able to report against what those funds were spent on or what were they used on. And the glaring requirement was twofold. On one hand, the Card Hero side was, there were a lot of corporates who said, well, you know, we don't want that contingent liability on our balance sheet when we issue corporate credit cards. And so we can only off issue corporate credit cards to a certain pool of employees within the organizations, very often it's senior executives, etc. But the need to be able to not lean on an employee's personal finances to pay for things and then do an expense claim, and the need to get clarity on what funds were used and, and making sure that they get the receipts and all that, uh, and, and the reporting around it, meant that they were looking for a solution whereby they could issue a virtual or physical uh, card that sits with, them, with an employee with zero balances and when funds are needed, they can be drawn down. Secondly, when clients were paying per diems and allowances, and travel allowances, etc., they needed to make sure that they could find uh, a means to put funds on a drip basis. So if you're away for 10 days, they'll give you two days upfront money and then thereafter, the night before you get funds for the next day in case very often trips get cut short and when they cut short, employees generally need to reimburse the company and that's a very painful process. The second opportunity lies really very much around the not-for-profits, uh, whether they're education or, or, or organizations linked to you know, things like you know, dispersing NDIS funds. And they're looking and they're dispersing significant amounts of funds and they need visibility around what's been spent on, uh, as opposed to the traditional model, which was either Mr. Professor or a person with a disability uh, or an SHG model with the education side, you know, you spend the money first and then we'll reimburse you. I, I think with the disbursement side for not for profits and all, you know, this one was really more a traditional bank account with two ATM cards. You spend money on the ATM card, uh, the carer spends money on the ATM card, and in a month you get, a, you get your statement, they share it with the, with, with the not for profit, they then report it to to the NDIS, etc., and it's a very delayed process. So once again, having a prepaid platform be uh, with transactions on a you know, near time, kind of 15, you know, five second lag time uh, to know what money's been spent on was critical. So we looked at it, looked at it, putting together a solution. Uh, you know, the, the prepaid card business has been around for quite a long time, and uh, we then you know you know designed both the businesses, both the models uh, in very close consultation with our clients who were interested. And we ended up arriving uh, in a partnership with EML. I think they are certainly a leader in the space. Uh, they are well recognized um, in the public and private sectors as well. Um, and we felt comfortable that this was the right partner to work with to build up our platform. And so hence the three agreement and effectively we will be issuing uh, with well, rather EMLs issuer and we'll be issuing a prepaid MasterCard um, through the Card Hero platform. The, the space is active. Um, we've ensured that we are building the most cutting edge possible uh, application uh, through the system. It is pulling in as much intelligence as possible. But the beauty of course is that, you know, through our internal systems, you know, the last 12 months we saw 600 million worth of spend managed through our processes. 
And so we understand very, very well uh, what is needed, uh, what it means to be successful. Um, and I think one of the things that's important is whenever we've launched uh, businesses, we, we have tended, well, first of all, our client base has always and only been large organizations of government. And I still remember when we launched Expense 8, uh, when we rebranded and, and, and put it out, the first client on board it was uh, Woolworths. And when we launched our travel product, the first two clients on board it were Federal Treasury and Federal Prime Minister and Cabinet. The reason why we go after a large uh, customer or, or you know, first one is, is that if you don't build and tool a platform to support an organization which is going to use enough of the platform and have enough edge cases and challenges on you, you're not going to build a platform that is, um, you know, it's robust enough to meet all the, you know, as many requirements as possible in the market. So you want something that meets the market and most of the time exceeds what most uh, of the market would require. So I'll just run through a little bit more slides here. Um, and that pretty much, you know, kind of in summary, uh, we're focused, we will, we will continue to expand on our soft order book with Expense 8. I think the corporates are continuing to spend more, we've got more features uh, coming on tap. I think that business is on great footing. I think Card Hero and Pay Hero allows us to overlay fintech solutions and revenue streams. Uh, and they are really very much businesses that have, have been very organically um, that created and grown out of an existing uh, client base. Mark, should I stop there and, uh, and take on some questions? Yeah, um, let's take some questions now, Nick. I actually had a few that were emailed through, so maybe I'll just tackle these ones first. Um, have you started talks with um, any of the large corporate customers on the Keir Card Hero product? Um, and, you know, what's been the initial feedback so far? Yeah, so uh, I guess to re reiterate, the, the ideas mainly came from the clients. And so mm -hmm. we're responding to them. Uh, I think they, they're quite happy with how we've approached it. Uh, certainly uh, during COVID, we've seen a acceleration of the usage of cards, uh, but those were corporate um, credit cards. And so I think, yeah, the, 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 the short answer is yes, uh, work from home, et cetera, and all that. They need to be able to tool the employees uh, with the ability to, to deal with expenses uh, more effectively. So, yeah. Okay. And then the other question that this um, person had was um, recurring revenue is a slight improvement over Q4. They just want to know, did they see, did you see that um, spending increase across the whole quarter? So, you know, July was up on June, I think, you know, August was up on July and September was up on August. Yes, that's what we saw. Uh, although the quarterly consolidated numbers don't don't show that picture, uh, but yeah, so you know, May, April, May, June, April itself was was quite uh, quite a fall, and then it started to to creep up and normalize now, and it's been on a on a growth path. And I think what's going to happen is because we are implementing six new agencies, and and of course we've got some corporate uh, and smaller ones which are non-material uh, activities around that. We're going to see a lift in the um, SaaS revenues in the, within this quarter. So we'll see that lift coming through. So we have to grow with new clients. We, we can't just, just rely on or hope that travel comes back. Okay, and then uh, just a couple of other questions are flying in now. Um, how is engagement going with the other Fed government entities under the SDO at the Department of Finance? Um, if any of them says no to expense it, what's usually the reason? Yeah, we've we've had very little of that. So the way the shared services work is that we are the provider of choice uh, from the shared service provider. So if you consume uh, shared services from industry, then you're going to use Technology One uh, for your financial ERP accounting, and you're going to use expense it, um, and you're going to use another software for payroll. For Department of Finance, it's going to be SAP and Expensive. And so if they want to consume the service from the shared service provider, they have to take you know, the range. Um, unless the agency is so small, and this is where you, you, know, you may have a knockback or just they, just they just don't come on board at all, 
but it's where it's a very, very small agency and they don't have that many proper credit cards and, and, and they just don't, they simply don't need it. So, yeah. Okay. And the, the revenue model for Card Hero? Yeah, so the Card Hero revenue model is you know, pretty, pretty much like an extension of the EML uh, model. So, mm-hmm. and, and we have our variations as well. And uh, the way it works ultimately is that it's a combination of a, a base multi-platform fee and then it is per card per month uh, and or a percentage of load fee. Um, so it depends on what kind of, uh, what, what the clients are looking for. Um, if they want to you know, uh, kind of floor uh, their cost to maintain the program, um, then we find ways to do it. Uh, the cool thing is that we are, we're always, we're not dealing with a consumer model, we're dealing with a corporate model. So we, there's a lot more visibility around trends and habits. Uh, from a historical standpoint, and we can continuously map the forward as well. Um, and then, obviously, there's a lot of work gone into Card Hero and, and, and currently updating the the existing system. Um, somebody wants to know about R&D rebates. It was in Q1 um, FY20, but there wasn't a, a payment for R&D rebates in Q1 FY21. Yeah. So those were paid, we, we were a little slower to get the rebates in the historical years. And, and then we caught up uh, in, in the last financial year. So in terms of uh, R&D, there is, there's quite a significant R&D going on, as you can imagine. So I think that will be the next um, submission uh, that will come through. Um, we don't particularly now, we, we don't really think too much about what that number is. Um, because it also depends on how fast, how we are looking at accelerating or, or, or you know, kind of managing the, the velocity of, of builds and R&D, et cetera. Uh, and also vis-a-vis the opportunities that come about. But um, yeah, well, we, we will continue to receive R&D rebates as a short answer, but I, I, kind of, I don't think we can quantify it. No. Yeah. Okay, I think that was the question that you're you're still entitled to, I think. Um, and then King, two last questions. Um, I'm not going to get to them all, but two last ones. Um, can we? Can you go into a little bit more on uh, sales pipeline um, on the, I guess, private side and and the, and the public side? Yeah. Uh, well, so by from a product standpoint, we look at expensive. I think I've shared quite a bit. Um, the, the the corporate activity, uh, the private activity, uh, continues. Um, but really, where we are is we need to focus on FedGov. Uh, there is a lot of activity around it now. Uh, you would, you, if you look through federal government, one of the things they are talking about is something called Gov ERP, which are whole of government arrangements, etc. That is something that we have to be laser focused on. Um, I think in our space, it will, it will not be a one single provider. It's probably going to be a panel. Um, there's some publicly available information around Gov ERP and travel and expense management, etc. As well. So we need to be focused on that uh, because one thing about these kind of businesses is that once you're in, it, you're in for a very long time. And even though it's an initial three-year period, I think to displace an existing provider, it's pretty challenging. Um, so for us, we've been very tra- we've trained our eyes to go against uh, the larger mandates like a shared service mandate because then we are, they are aggregating the clients for us. And then final question, um, kind of COVID related as well. What percentage of revenue is linked to travel and how does the company intend dressing the expected lower travel spend, I guess, across all clients, public or private, um, for the foreseeable future? Yeah, so the historical direct travel spend is about 6 to 7% of the revenue, but travel related, that means nothing to do with travel anymore, but when you're on the trip, you're going to have a coffee. Every time you have a coffee, you swipe a card. The revenue model to us is between 15 and 30 cents. So travel and travel related. Uh, I think the low point was we, we, we basically went down about 22, 23% uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a rolling basis, uh, not year on year, on a rolling basis. And, and then we, we've started to see that recover now. So I think now we're We wouldn't, the, I think the, the number should still be around a 10, 12, 13% uh, kind of space. Uh, we do see sporadic travel coming through as well. 
Okay. I think the last thing I'd like to just finish off with is I, I don't think I addressed the car hero business development side. Um, mm -hmm. I think I think that is really a, an area of key focus for us and an area whereby we can really actively go out and reach out. And the nice thing is that these client segments are, are very familiar to us and we think we, we should be able to um, you know, reasonably engage quickly uh, and, and deliver them a solution that, that they'd be happy with. Okay, great. Nick, thank you very much. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there because we've got to move on thank to you. our second presenter. Um, but yeah, if anybody wants to find out more about uh, Aid Common, um, who should they get in touch with or where, where should they go? Yeah, they can certainly email me, uh, nic nick at aidcommon.com. Uh, and are the, uh, the, the IR guys. Okay. And this yeah. presentation is on the ASX announcement platform yes. or is going up. It is. Okay. So people can it's reference up. it there. It's up. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. I'd like to now hand over to Mr. Andreas Creel from the MEM for our second one. Uh, Andreas, I can see your cover screen now, or your sorry, your cover slide now. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark, for the for the kind introduction. Good morning, everybody. Um, so, Mark, I I assume you can hear me well. Um, yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Yeah. All right. So uh, then, I would now like to move everybody into the world of water treatment. Um, so DMEM, the, the name of my company um, stands for Decentralized Membranes. Um, so with DMEM, we are looking at decentralized water treatment applications. Um, the, uh, the picture that you can see here on this front slide of our presentation, that gives an, an image of uh, a standard product of, of DMEM. It's a containerized modular water treatment system. Um, it's located next to the factory of a large multinational, in that case, a customer in, in Singapore, a large corporation from the food and beverage sector. Um, and we help this company under a long-term build on operate uh, service contract uh, to treat the wastewater that's generated by their production to legal discharge standards. And that's kind of a very typical uh, business uh, arrangement for our uh, company as well. Um, DMEM are decentralized membranes. Um, so um, it stands for two things, uh, the decentralized theme, uh, but also the membranes, which is the, uh, the particular technology which we deploy. Um, the, uh, the membranes, uh, it's a type of filter which goes into our systems as the key component, a little bit the Intel inside. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a few more details about these technologies in, in just a minute. Uh, about the, the business model, um, there is uh, three key themes um, which I would like to summarize in, in short words. Um, um, so the, the one thing is um, that we've positioned the company around a one-stop shop offering um, in particular for industrial customers. Um, um, because that's where we see the, the key opportunity. Um, so besides uh, delivering innovative membrane technologies um, as, uh, as equipment, uh, as turnkey equipment, uh, we have positioned the company in a way that we are able to supply everything into our industrial customers, uh, which they need for water and wastewater treatment applications. So that includes consumables, that includes pumps, water treatment chemicals as well. Um, and lastly, if customers desire that, and, and many do, many customers, industrial customers like that model, um, then we can offer uh, them uh, a service, uh, like a full and hassle-free service uh, under which we provide equipment on a leasing basis. Um, and then we operate and maintain the equipment for our customers uh, on, on their behalf. Um, so that comes along with the, uh, the second uh, key theme around our business model, uh, which is around the recurring revenues. Um, so um, since uh, the, we listed on the stock exchange over the last two or three years, uh, we have strongly focused the company around the recurring revenue segments, which again is the, uh, the service business, which is the supply of, of consumables, which are uh, well, very, very recurring and stable revenues. Um, and 
that obviously that adds a lot of stability to our company, which has helped us a lot to go through this uh, COVID crisis uh, in, in pretty good shape. Um, um, and uh, um, obviously these recurring revenues, um, they bring a lot of value uh, in, into DMAM. Um, and then um, lastly, um, geographically, we have a very strong focus on Australia at this stage. Uh, we see a very strong opportunity in Australia. Uh, the decentralized market uh, supply of containerized, uh, smaller on-site water treatment systems, uh, it's a very fragmented market. You would find like a, a lot of uh, smaller mom and dad type companies operating in that segment. Um, uh, the market, in a sense, is, is ripe for consolidation, uh, which not necessarily means M&A, uh, but which, uh, which means that some companies will emerge as market leader, gain market share, uh, because they work uh, a little bit smarter uh, than, than others. Um, they have um, uh, technologies which come with uh, certain advantages. Um, and that's exactly where we see DMAM. Um, Australia alone, uh, for our products, it's an addressable market of certainly uh, a two to three hundred million dollars a year. Uh, we do believe uh, that we should be able uh, to to grow the company uh, to something like fifty to sixty million in in revenues in Australia alone in the foreseeable future. Um, and then, obviously, uh, on the longer term, there's a, a lot of demand for innovative water treatment products in the Asia Pacific region and. and and then also in, in other parts of the world. Uh, a little bit of statistics about DMAM. We have about 60 employees at this stage, most of them in Australia. Uh, their main site being uh, just north of, of Brisbane uh, with uh, some international outposts in Singapore and, and Germany. That takes us to our technologies. Um, so that's the, uh, the membranes, uh, which are already mentioned. Um, the picture on the bottom right that shows our, uh, well, head of technology development and manufacturing in Singapore, uh, looking at a bundle of our mem membranes. Um, uh, the type of membranes is called a hollow fiber. So you're looking at a structure uh, which is basically uh, similar to a straw. It's hollow in the interior. Um, and then the outside, the walls of the straw are microporous. Um, uh, so we can uh, well manufacture these, um, these fibers, these straws in, in Singapore in our manufacturing site, and we can fine tune the, the pore size, uh, which has led to this portfolio of hollow fiber membranes, which you see here on that slide. Um, technologies like the microfiltration, ultrafiltration, or the nanofiltration membrane, uh, they vary in pore size uh, with that uh, hollow fiber nanofiltration membrane. Uh, as the name tells you, um, displaying the, the smallest pore size at the nanometer range, uh, which makes this nanofiltration membrane quite unique in the industry, but basically with DMEM uh, among those companies in the industry, which can make these pores uh, the, the smallest, which uh, helps us then to produce very high quality treated water uh, under low, uh, um, under low uh, operating pressure um, and uh, energy cost, which saves a lot on the operating cost. Um, uh, water treatment is diverse. Uh, there's many applications because you find a lot of uh, contaminants in, in wastewater. Um, customers have uh, many different types of uh, requirements. So we've built this uh, portfolio of technologies uh, which has different sweet spots. Um, we have another um, very special membrane in, in this a technology portfolio here, which is this forward osmosis membrane, uh, which can be used uh, for concentration applications. Uh, for example, as part of the uh, production of uh, beverages like orange juice, um, instead of uh, thermal evaporation technologies uh, to produce concentrate uh, in a very gentle manufacturing process. And going forward, uh, well, we have a small uh, R&D setup in, in Singapore, small but efficient. Uh, we will certainly be presenting uh, new technologies, uh, new membranes in the, the near-term future, which add to this uh, technology portfolio. On the next slide, you would find like a couple of uh, good examples uh, of uh, how we deploy these technologies. So that's project examples. Uh, because our business model, as mentioned, is not to sell off the uh, technology as a component, uh, but to build uh, and engineer a turnkey water or wastewater treatment system for the client to go to the end customer directly. 
uh, because we believe that this will uh, generate a lot more value for, for DMAM. Uh, on the left, you would want to uh, find a, a project example. Uh, that project has been completed in December 2019. Um, that's about the supply of a three million Australian dollar desalination plant uh, to a customer in Australia. A customer actually is a resort uh, in the Great Barrier Reef region. And this water, uh, this uh, this system, it takes water out of the ocean. Uh, and converts it into potable water for the resort. Um, since we handed over, we've been engaged by the client to operate this uh, resort, uh, this uh, water treatment facility under a long-term service contract, uh, which also shows how the different business models, uh, supply of equipment and provision of a service operations and maintenance service uh, often are connected. On the right side of that slide, uh, you would see a, a good example for an uh, well industrial project here, uh, industrial wastewater treatment project. The client is uh, the worldwide market leader in the flavors and fragrances, uh, well subsegment of FNB. Um, this one is a built on operate project. It was awarded to DMEM uh, by the end of the, the last year. Um, the system uh, treats wastewater from the client's factory in Singapore to legal discharge standards. Um, is pretty much uh, ready for commissioning this month. Um, and uh, I would like to take this as an opportunity actually to show a few pictures. Just a second. So this takes us now um, into the inside of these two containers. Um, uh, what you see on these pictures, um, those are, uh, well, ultra filtration membrane modules. Um, so that comes back to our DMEM proprietary membranes. Uh, I've just uh, introduced uh, these uh, technologies. So water is pushed uh, under light pressure through these membranes. The membranes work like a sieve. It's a microporous structure. Um, contaminants, uh, which are larger than these uh, small pores, tiny little pores are rejected. Water molecules are very, very small. They pass through the pores uh, into the inside of this hollow fiber structure. Um, on this next picture, you can see the, uh, the hollow fibers. Um, uh, and the, the following picture shows you um, uh, a little bit better how the, the membranes uh, look from the inside. Uh, so here you can see uh, the hollow interior. Um, it's called the, the lumen of the membrane. Um, and then uh, at the end, uh, well, of this hollow fiber bundle, which is um, uh, pushed into this uh, wide tube, the membrane module, uh, you would you would see the the uh, the hollow interior, and that's where the clean water uh, then is basically released into a pipe, and it's directed to uh, where, wherever the customer wants to have it. Um, um, the membranes here, as you can see on the next picture from our manufacturing side in, in Singapore, they are spun in a very simple chemical mixing and uh, extrusion process. Um, coming back into the uh, container, we then take these membrane modules. Um, as mentioned, our business model is not to sell off the, the module to another engineering company, uh, but we integrate them into a turnkey system. We are using other technologies as well. Um, that's quite standard in, in water treatment because uh, wastewater can be very diverse. Uh, what happens here is um, that we're in a pretreatment step uh, dosing chemicals. Um, that's the coagulants which you see here on, on this picture um, to take out uh, larger particles uh, from the water stream um, so that the water already has a reasonable quality because, before it hits the, the membrane surface. Uh, which helps to extend the, the lifetime of the, uh, the membranes as the key and most valuable component in, in this water treatment plant uh, and ultimately saves cost for, for the client. Um, uh, so different treatment steps uh, come together and are integrated by our company, uh, including the electronics, as you can see here, uh, and then presented to the customer uh, through like a simple HMI touchscreen uh, which makes it possible for the customer to uh, well plug and play uh, that water treatment system connected simply to their existing facility. Um, and then this last picture shows uh, the outside image of the product. It's a neat uh, standard industrial container, uh, which uh, can easily be transported to the, the customer side. 
that takes us back to the presentation. So our customers uh, historically in Australia uh, on the mining and infrastructure side, Rio Tinto has been a very large customer of, uh, of DMEM. Uh, we have a very long-term uh, service contract in place with Rio uh, for one of their largest mining sites in, in Queensland. Um, the growth uh, of DMEM, and we will come to the financials in, in just a second, um, that has come a lot from the food and beverage and agricultural sectors. Um, uh, so besides those customers, which I mentioned here, we managed to close a first project with a very large uh, Australian vegetable, vegetable producer. Um, and we mentioned about that in the first quarterly for this year. Uh, we managed to close a first project in Tasmania, actually with a very large um, international agricultural group um, that was presented in the uh, quarterly for the, the second quarter of the calendar year. Uh, and we see a very strong pipeline in particular uh, from the food and beverage uh, and agricultural sectors, uh, which comes along with the regional expansion of our company from Queensland uh, into Southeast Australia and Tasmania, which was uh, taking place over the past 12 months. We listed DMEM on the Australian Stock Exchange in April 2017. Um, DMEM is backed by a Singapore-based venture capital fund. Uh, pretty late introduction to myself. Um, before I joined DMEM about four, four and a half years ago as the full-time CEO, um, I used to be the, uh, the managing director of that in, uh, venture capital fund. It's a fund called New Asia Investments. Um, which is on the register of DMEM uh, through two entities, uh, still the largest shareholder uh, with these two holdings combined. Um, um, and then over the past uh, two and a half or three years, we've managed to build like a nice uh, and, and solid uh, institutional shareholder base behind DMEM, which includes the perennial fund, uh, which is a Sydney-based uh, micro cap uh, and small cap fund. Um, but also um, in the last um, well investment round of our company in November, December 2019, we saw the Pathfinder Asset Management Group uh, joining the register, uh, which is an Auckland-based investor, New Zealand-based investor, which beyond the money obviously uh, provides a great pathway for DMEM into the New Zealand uh, well agricultural and food and beverage markets. So that's the uh, summary of the business model of our products and technologies. Uh, this next slide, it shows what we've made out of that in financial terms. Um, uh, company DMEM is still a pretty young company, has been operating for not much more than, than four or five years. Uh, we have grown uh, to about 12 million in cash receipts in the past calendar year. For us, the calendar year is the financial year. Um, this growth is continuing in the ongoing year. We've seen uh, 7.4 million in cash receipts in the first six months, uh, which makes us uh, very confident uh, that we will hit the guidance which we have given to the ASX uh, of about 14 to 18 million in cash receipts uh, for the full calendar year 2020. Um, this comes along with a very strong growth uh, of the recurring revenue segments, which is the service business, uh, the sale of consumables, um, that alone uh, will provide more than 9 million Australian dollars in cash receipts in the ongoing calendar year, uh, which obviously also supports this um, top line guidance which we've given to the ASX and which has helped us tremendously uh, to get through COVID in, in a good shape. Uh, along with the revenue growth, margins have been growing to approximately 30%. Um, going down um, to the, the bottom of the PNL, uh, we have seen uh, net operating cash outflows of about $870,000 in the first six months of the, the calendar year. Um, that reflects uh, the ongoing investment into the R&D side, the, uh, the technology, the membrane manufacturing in Singapore, which we are scaling up at, at this stage still. Um, also, with some uh, well reasonable investments into building a larger sales and marketing organization in Australia. Uh, we have a strong cash balance of about $6 million as of 30th June, and relative to that cash burn, relative to the ongoing growth, uh, we think we are very well funded to achieve 
um, operating cash flow break even. Um, and the, the uh, guidance that we've given to the ASX is that we expect that in the foreseeable future. Uh, so over the, the coming quarters, uh, we would expect to see the, uh, the first uh, cash flow positive uh, quarters for, for DMAT. I think I mentioned about the uh, recurring revenue growth. Uh, so we can uh, go to the final slide to the, the summary, uh, which basically um, gives the, provides the outlook uh, for the next uh, couple of years. Um, um, so we're again, very confident that we will see uh, further uh, top line growth for our company uh, for the ongoing year. Uh, we've given a guidance of 14 to $18 million to the ASX. Um, we, we see a, a very strong pipeline in particular from segments like the uh, food and beverage and agricultural industries. Um, um, so uh, uh, looking at the uh, geographic, geographic focus um, at this stage uh, for the next 12 to 18 months, focus very much on Australia still. Uh, we have expanded the business well into Tasmania and the Southeast of Australia, and we will see uh, we're very confident that we will see uh, further orders coming from those uh, region in, in the next few months. Um, uh, next thing on the agenda for us to be an Australia-wide supplier is to set up in Invest in Australia. Uh, that's certainly an important milestone. Uh, and then internationally expansion into New Zealand uh, and the Asia Pacific region, uh, which has a lot of demand for modern water treatment technologies will, will follow. And that takes us to the end of my presentation and uh, happy to take questions by email, uh, obviously now in, in the Q&A session. Thanks, Andreas. Yeah, we got a couple of questions. I'm just going to go through them quickly. Um, just quickly, I don't know how, how much you've looked at the budget, but um, you know the announcement of tax breaks for capital equipment, would you see that as a, as a positive for, for DMEM, for you know, the, the food and beverage guys, I guess, that they can you know, write off a lot of that um, CapEx you know, straight away rather than amortizing it over, over a couple of years? So for, for DMEM itself, the charm of our business model is that it's not very capital uh, intensive. Uh, so for our own business, uh, we, we don't depend on these tax breaks in, in a sense. Um, um, so scaling our business uh, in, in that context also wouldn't require much, much capital. Um, um, that being said, for our customers, and we've seen that in a number of cases in, in the past few months, um, the, uh, the tax breaks actually make it attractive um, to invest in upgrading their water treatment processes. Um, um, and it's indeed something uh, which we've seen over the, far, the, the past few months uh, that customers come back to us now uh, because it's a lot more attractive for them uh, to invest in a new water treatment system. Okay, great. And I guess, yeah, I mean, question around how is your technology different to, I guess, the most other well-known name on the ASX in terms of water treatment, Fluence Corp. Maybe if you could just outline, you know, some of the similarities and possibly some of the differences between yourself and Fluence. Yeah. Um, so there's a fundamental, um, well, difference between the, the technologies. So Fluence technology is a biological technology. It's a biological process, uh, which basically activates bacteria to absorb contaminants. Um, uh, our technology is a physical process. Uh, it works like a sieve uh, by sieving or filtering out uh, small, tiny contaminants from a, a water stream. Um, um, so that's, that's the, the technical um, difference. Um, and then uh, in terms of applications, um, that, that makes um, the, the, the technology suited for different types of applications. Um, uh, so with membranes, uh, with DMEM, we typically come in um, at, a, at a later stage in the value chain. Now, when customers need uh, treated water, which has very, very high quality, uh, for example, when water needs to be recycled into the production, when a brewery comes and wants to polish uh, tap water because they need water that's even better than the, the tap water quality, which is already pretty good. Um, uh, so that's when we would come in with DMEM uh, with our membrane technologies. Um, uh, it's a 
very, very large market, um, uh, but it's a relatively high value add and, and high margin compared to other technologies in a very fragmented water treatment market. Okay. And then in terms of, if we can just discuss the growth pipeline, we've got a question on that. Um, you know, are you looking to have a presence in every state in Australia or are you focused on, you know, growing Asia simultaneously? I'm just trying to get a sense of, you know, where the, the growth focus is now. Yeah, so for the for the near term future, um, the next 12 to 18 months, we still focus very much uh, on, on Australia. And I think with all the restrictions in place at the moment, that also very logically makes, makes sense. Um, but it also reflects the opportunity that we see in Australia in this uh, very fragmented market with, with very uh, fragmented competition and a lot of small players um, being active. Um, um, that being said, well, we still have a somewhat uh, centralized organization for Australia. We have our main workshop in, in Brisbane, just north of Brisbane. Uh, we have another workshop in Tasmania. Uh, we have a couple of smaller sales offices, one in Adelaide and one in Melbourne, because it's important to be close to the customer. Um, um, but then, um, as, as I was saying, for the manufacturing, um, that's uh, centralized in those two, um, well, uh, locations as, as mentioned okay and i've got an email question in here as well the the physical units andreas can they be operated remotely or do you have to i guess uh send somebody there to take readings or provide readings or you know, how often do you have to change the filters Absolutely, the, the units can be operated remotely. So for many of the units which we have on the service contracts uh, or for many others which we have uh, supplied to customers uh, under a standard equipment sale, uh, we have actually a remote access uh, to, to the systems. Yeah? So we can see how they operate, we can monitor the data and to some extent we can also uh, operate them remotely. Uh, so that's a, a standard, uh, well, aspect to the, the equipment which we supply. Okay, and changing the membranes, how often does that need to happen? That depends on the, on the feed water quality. Uh, so typically it's a range in between two and up to five years or so. Uh, for industrial wastewater, which is aggressive to the membrane surface, obviously the uh, that period would be a little bit shorter, something around two years. Um, uh, if the, the feed water quality is not so bad, now then, then it can take longer. But it, it's important for our business model because obviously uh, the membranes are a consumable and once we sell a, a system, there is an automatic need uh, of the customer to replace these membranes. So for, let's say for an F&B client, it's probably closer to the five years, but for, uh, a more industrial heavy uh, manufacturing business it's closer to two years is that fair yeah, to that say? depends uh, fmb waste can be quite severe as well uh, with a lot of uh, oil and grease in, inside um, um so it, it really depends but uh in, in in a sense mark yes you're, you're correct okay okay andreas uh we're going to leave it there because we're just approaching uh 10 o'clock. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch with you or find out more about DMEM, uh, where, what's the best? Oh, there you go there. Yes, so the contact email address uh, that's that's listed on that last slide. So happy, certainly happy, most happy to take any questions offline. Okay, so I can go to you or I can go to, go to George. Okay, um, with that, I think we'll wrap up uh, this session. I'd like to thank uh, Nick, if he's still with us, um, and Andreas for uh, what has been a series number 12 in the Cafe Microcaps morning meeting. And we'll end it there because I know the opening match is just about to start happening now. So I'll let people get back to their desks and their screens. Okay, thanks, Andreas. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Mark.